The first murder attributed to the Boston Strangler was committed on June 14, 1962. The victim was Anna E. Sleezers, a 55-year-old seamstress. It was initially attributed to a suicide, but was then believed to have been the result of a botched robbery, even though several pieces of jewelry were found at the scene. Between that day and August 30th, five more women were killed, the second, an 85-year-old, died of a heart attack while her attacker was trying to strangle her. All of those victims were middle-aged or elderly, the youngest being 55. The strangler then appears to have stopped killing for a few months, returning on December 5th. During this second round of murders, the victims were usually in their late teens or early 20s. At the last crime scene, that of Mary Sullivan on January 4th, 1964, the killer left a Happy New Year card propped up against her left foot. During the investigation, two psychics got involved with the task force in charge of the case, the Strangler Bureau. The first, Paul Gordon, was an ad copywriter said to have ESP powers. He made a description of the killer of Anna E. Sleezers which fit Arnold Wallace, not his real name, a mental patient held at Boston State Hospital who had escaped on several occasions, most of which coincided with the Strangler murders. When he was consulted about the seventh Strangler murder, that of Sophie Clark, he, surprisingly, displayed detailed knowledge of her apartment and made a description that fit Louis Barnett, who was an initial suspect in the murder. Nothing concrete came out of Gordon's advice. The second psychic, Peter Herkos, was a well-known career psychic. He claimed to have assisted in the investigation and is confirmed to have been in Boston at the time of the investigation and to have spent time with the police, but a few days later, he was arrested for impersonating a police officer in order to gather information and later convicted of it. James A. Brussel, who previously had made a spot on profile of the Mad Bomber in New York, aided the authorities. Unlike many contemporary and later psychologists and psychoanalysts involved in the case, he asserted that the murders were the work of a single man, attributing the changes in his behavior to changes in his regular life. In November of 1964, a convicted burglar named Albert de Salvo was caught for an unrelated series of attacks and confessed to the Strangler murders. Albert Henry de Salvo was born on September 3, 1931 in Chelsea, Massachusetts. His father, Frank de Salvo, was a sadistic, violent, alcoholic fisherman from Newfoundland who brutally abused his wife, Charlotte de Salvo, Albert and his five siblings, one brother and four sisters, and would regularly take home prostitutes and have sex with them in front of his family. Albert once saw him beat all the teeth out of Charlotte's mouth and then break her fingers one by one. Frank also once sold all his children to a farmer in Maine for $9, though they managed to break out and return home, at which point Frank began teaching him to steal and encouraged him to do so. In 1943, age 12, Albert was arrested for battery and robbery and was sent to a reform school. The next year he was paroled and got a job as a delivery boy. He was sent back to the same reform school for auto theft only two years later. At the age of 17, after being released, he enlisted in the U.S. Army and was sent to Europe, where he met a German woman, Ermgard Beck, whom he married and brought back to the States, where he did a second tour in the. During his second tour, at Fort Dix, New Jersey, he was arrested for molesting a nine-year-old girl, narrowly escaping conviction because her parents wouldn't press charges. In spite of his court-martial, he was honorably discharged in 1956. Shortly afterwards, he was arrested twice for robbery. He demanded sex from his wife six times a day and called her rigid if she refused. When their first child, a girl named Judy, was born with a pelvis disease, she kept their sex life to a minimum, afraid that any other children they might have might also have conditions. They eventually conceived a healthy son, Michael, together. In the time between DeSalvo's second discharge and March of 1960, he committed a series of attacks known as the Measuring Men Crimes, during which he would pose as a talent scout from a modeling agency named Johnson in order to get inside women's homes and con them into undressing so he could pretend to take their measurements, fondling them while doing so. Though he confessed to the attacks when he was arrested for burglary, no charges for them were filed and he was sentenced to 11 months in prison for only the burglary charge. 
After being released from prison, De Salvo committed a series of home invasions known as the The Green Man Attacks. Dressed in green work clothes, he would break into apartments belonging to women, tie them to their beds in a spread eagle position at knife point, sexually assault them, and leave. A victim who was attacked on October 27, 1964 gave the police a description of the assailant, which led the investigators to DeSalvo and was published in newspapers, leading to more victims coming forward. Earlier on October 27, DeSalvo attempted to break into a home by posing as a motorist. In November, he was arrested for the assaults and confessed not only to them, but also to being the Boston Strangler. He made further confessions under hypnosis. Though his descriptions of the murders and the crime scenes had inconsistencies, he did know some details which had not been revealed to the public. In 1967, he was found guilty of the Green Man attacks and sentenced to life in prison as a result of a plea bargain his lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, who later acted as defense for O.J. Simpson and Patty Hearst, made with the prosecution. In February of the next year, he escaped from his imprisonment together with two other inmates, but turned himself into Bailey the next day. In 1973, he was found brutally stabbed to death in his cell. Nobody was ever found guilty of his murder. Though he confessed to the Strangler murders, there are still some doubts as to whether DeSalvo's claims about them were credible. For one thing, his confessions were not completely consistent with the evidence, in many cases, he got the time of death wrong, sometimes he got whether the victim's death was caused by manual or ligature strangulation wrong, and in the case of Mary Sullivan, he stated that he had sexually penetrated her, and yet no semen was found on her body. She was, however, sexually assaulted with a broom handle. Additionally, there was no physical evidence linking DeSalvo to the murders and no witness could place him on any of the crime scenes. Because the victims vary widely in age, race, and social class, and the modi operandi in the attacks varied, some believe the murders to be the work of multiple killers. FBI profiler Robert Ressler agreed with this theory also remarking that it is very implausible that a serial killer who murders 13 women would simply stop killing in favor of sexual assaults. Of the same opinion is fellow profiler John Douglas, who claimed that most of the Strangler's murders showed signs of a sexually sadistic rapist slash killer, while DeSalvo was merely a power reassurance rapist. Additionally, DeSalvo was braggart and is believed to have exaggerated his confessions, according to Dr. Ames Roby, the psychiatrist who evaluated him at Bridgewater State Hospital, DeSalvo wanted so badly to be the strangler. One theory about why he would make a false confession is that he wanted to make money from it to support his family, he had told Bailey that he hoped to do so. In 2001, forensic analysis of the exhumed body of Mary Sullivan, the last victim of the strangler killings, found DNA on her underwear and pubic hair which belonged neither to her nor to DeSalvo. On June 11, 2013, it had been announced that newly discovered DNA evidence linked DeSalvo to the murder of Sullivan, and that authorities are having DeSalvo's body exhumed for further evidence. In July the same year, the authorities announced that a DNA comparison between DeSalvo and semen found at the Sullivan crime scene had confirmed that DeSalvo was the source. The Strangler's victims were women of several different ethnicities and of widely varying ages, the youngest was 19 and the oldest 85. During the first phase of the killings, the victims were often older and during the second phase, younger. He entered their homes through home invasions, where he attacked them sexually. As the Strangler's nickname implies, the victims were killed by strangulation, usually with their own nylon stockings. Sometimes the killer constructed ligatures by weaving together a bunch of smaller ones. According to some sources, the Strangler also had a habit of tying the murder weapons and or other handy lengths of fabric such as handkerchiefs around the victim's necks into a bow. One thing that was later noted by profilers was that, though the murders attributed to the Strangler have similarities, there were differences between them. Some victims were posed, some were not. Some murders were brutal and aggressive while some were more clinical and efficient. Some victims were physically raped while some were sexually assaulted with blunt objects from the house. Evelyn Corbin was forced to perform oral sex on her killer. A few victims were stabbed, Beverly Simons was killed solely by 25-plus stab wounds, mostly around her right breast. The rest were not stabbed. 
Some victims were strangled with multiple ligatures while some were strangled using only one. One victim, Ida Erga, was killed by manual strangulation. Known Victims 1962 June 14, Boston, Massachusetts, Anna E. Sleezers, 55, sexually assaulted with an unspecified object, non-fatally strangled with a belt, fatally strangled with the cord of her bathrobe, and tied it around her neck post-mortem. June 28, Boston, Massachusetts, Mary Mullen, 85, indirectly, died of a heart attack when he attempted to strangle her. June 30, Boston, Massachusetts, Nina Nichols, 68, sexually assaulted with a wine bottle and strangled with a nylon stocking, tied two stockings around her neck post-mortem. Lynn, Massachusetts, Helen Blake, 65, sexually assaulted and strangled with a nylon stocking like the previous victim, tied the nylon and a bra around her neck post-mortem. August 19th, Beacon Hill, Massachusetts, Ida Erga, 75, sexually assaulted and manually strangled, a pillowcase was tied around her neck post-mortem. August 30th, Boston, Massachusetts, Jane Sullivan, 67, sexually assaulted and strangled with her nylon stockings. December 5th, Boston, Massachusetts, Sophie Clark, 20, sexually assaulted and strangled with her nylon stockings and a petticoat. December 31st, Boston, Massachusetts, Patricia Bissett, 23, raped and strangled with a ligature made of several interwoven nylon stockings and a blouse, was one month pregnant at the time of her death. 1963 March 9th, Lawrence, Massachusetts, Mary Brown, 69, raped, stabbed in the breasts with a fork, and strangled, fatally bludgeoned with a pipe. May 8th, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Beverly Simons, 23, stabbed four times in the neck and 22 times in the torso, two scarves and a nylon stocking were tied around her neck post-mortem. September 6th, Salem, Massachusetts, Evelyn Corbin, 58, raped, forced to perform oral sex, and strangled with two stockings. November 23rd, Lawrence, Massachusetts, Joan Graff, 23, beaten, raped, and strangled with two nylon stockings and a black leotard. January 4th, 1964, Boston, Massachusetts, Mary Sullivan, 19, sexually assaulted with a broom handle and strangled with two scarves and a nylon stocking, then them around her neck post-mortem. Tommy Lynn Sells Sells was born on June 28, 1964, in Oakland, California to a single mother who already had four children she couldn't handle. In order to lighten her load, the new arrival was sent to live with his Aunt Bonnie in Walpole, Missouri. When he was five, Bonnie asked her sister if she could adopt the boy whom she loved like one of her own. Rather than giving him a chance at life, his mother had balked. Enraged by the request, she had demanded that the son she barely knew be returned to her at once. And with that, Sel's chances of becoming a productive citizen were forever dashed. Finding himself in a toxic environment courtesy of his birth mother, Sells rebelled at a young age. By the time he turned seven, he had already become a full-fledged alcoholic. At the age of eight, a family friend began molesting him on a regular basis. He would later say that he was certain his mother knew what was happening but hadn't cared enough to put a stop to the abuse. Years down the line, when his horrific crimes came to light, he would claim that his uncontrollable need to hurt others stemmed from the molestation and his mother's indifference. At the age of 14, Sells had run away from home, vowing never to return. He broke that promise three years later when he made an impromptu visit to the family home. His pent-up hostilities towards his mother boiling over, he had attempted to sexually assault the woman he blamed for ruining his life. Fueled by her lifelong disdain of the child she never wanted, she had physically thrown him out of the house, telling him that she hoped she never laid eyes on him again. The next time she saw his face was on the 6 o'clock news. On July 5, 1979, 39-year-old John Kate was shot dead during a home invasion in Mississippi. While the perpetrator was never caught, a description of a young man witnesses observed running from the scene matched that of Tommy Lynn Sells. Although his presence in the area at the time of the murder had made him a strong suspect, he had been allowed to go free due to a lack of evidence. 
Sell's first known arrest occurred in the early months of 1982 when he was picked up for public intoxication. After spending a night in the drunk tank, he was released with a warning that he was headed down a dangerous path and needed to shape up before he reached the point of no return. These words of wisdom had gone in one ear and out the other. The headstrong teenager knew exactly where he was going and couldn't get there fast enough. Refusing to be tied to any one area. Sells drifted from state to state for much of his adult life, committing any number of crimes along the way. With no skills to speak of, he had performed odd jobs here and there in order to buy food and personal items. While still in his teens, Sells became addicted to street drugs. His habit would land him in prison multiple times in the coming years. Fortunately for him, his sentences were always short, allowing him to pick up where he left off in no time at all. One of the first of the many rapes and murders that have been attributed to Sells took place on April 27, 1982, in St. Louis, Missouri when Joanne Clenny Tate, age 35, was brutally slain in her home. The perpetrator had then sexually assaulted a seven-year-old girl named Melissa, who was also present in the residence. After brutalizing the youngster, he had fled the scene, leaving her bruised and bloodied, but still very much alive. The traumatized child had initially identified the attacker as Joanne's former boyfriend, Rodney Lincoln. On the strength of her testimony, he was convicted of the murder and rape, despite his steadfast denials that he had been anywhere near the residence on the night in question. Decades later, upon seeing a photo of Tommy Lynn Sells, Melissa realized that he had been the guilty party all along. Though she recanted her identification of Lincoln, his conviction stood. He would serve 36 years in prison before finally being released. On July 31, 1983, Colleen Gill, 33, and her four-year-old daughter Tiffany, were beaten to death in their home in St. Louis. A man seen running from the scene had fit Sell's description to A.T. Even though it was determined that he had been staying nearby at the time, with no physical evidence linking him to the murders, no charges were filed against him. After temporarily dropping off the radar, Sell struck again on July 26, 1985, this time in the city of Springfield, Missouri. It was there that he met 28-year-old Ana Court and her four-year-old son Rory while working for a traveling carnival. The way Sells remembered it, he and Ana had engaged in consensual sex that evening while the little boy slept. Sometime during the night, he claimed to have awakened to find the young mother rifling through his knapsack. Believing that she was trying to steal his meager earnings, he had beaten her to death with a baseball bat. Fearing that little Rory could identify him, he had then done the same to the toddler. By the time that the bodies were discovered a week later, the carnival had moved on, taking the killer with it. In May of 1987, 27-year-old Suzanne Corks vanished after leaving a nightclub in Lockport, New York, not far from Niagara Falls. Her body was found eight years later, less than two miles from where she went missing. In 2004, Sells, who had been seen in Lockport around the time of her disappearance, confessed to her murder. Five months after Suzanne's disappearance, another young woman, 21-year-old Stephanie Kelly Stroh, went missing from a truck stop in Lovelock, Nevada. Long after the fact, Sells admitted that he had picked her up as she was hitchhiking to Reno. Once he had her in the car, he had strangled her to death before dumping her remains in one of the many hot springs that populate the state. Her body has never been found. His appetite for murder apparently insatiable, on November 17, 1987, Sells had committed what would prove to be his most heinous murders to date. As was his habit, he had taken advantage of the kindness of strangers who had only wanted to do the right thing by their fellow man. On that fateful day, Sells had been hitchhiking through Ina, Illinois when Keith Dardine, 29, made the mistake of offering him a ride. A friendly sort who never met a stranger, Keith had invited the filthy vagabond to his family's home for a hot meal. Never one to pass up a golden opportunity to do wrong, Sells had readily accepted. They had barely made it through the door before Sells pulled out a handgun and shot Keith Dardine in the back of the head. Not quite satisfied just yet, he had fired a second shot into his charitable host before cutting off his penis with a boning knife. When Keith's heavily pregnant wife Elaine came upon the ghastly scene only moments later, Sells had marched her into the bedroom and ordered her to lie down. 
After binding her to the bedposts, he had bludgeoned her three-year-old son Peter to death with a baseball bat. When he was finished, he had turned his attention back to a visibly terrified Elaine. As he began beating her with the bat, the trauma had caused her to go into premature labor. As her own life was ebbing away, she delivered the baby girl who would have made their family complete. The newborn, who her parents had already named Casey, was alive and breathing on her own, but not for long. Though the infant posed no threat whatsoever to cells, he had beaten her to death in the same manner as her mother and brother. Before departing, the ruthless killer had sexually assaulted Elaine with the baseball bat, leaving the implement protruding from inside her, purely for shock value. Those who had the misfortune of viewing the carnage were convinced that the Dardines had spent the last moments of their lives in the presence of unadulterated evil. Sal's is believed to have struck again a little over a year later. This time, he had attacked 51-year-old Kent Allen Loudon, a homeless man he had befriended at an encampment in Tucson, Arizona. The victim's body, which had borne multiple stab wounds, was discovered two days after he was last seen. In 1990, Sells was finally arrested not for rape or murder but for stealing a truck. After being found guilty of the property crime, he was sent to prison for a term of 16 months. During his incarceration, he was ordered to undergo psychiatric testing in an attempt to get to the bottom of his worsening antisocial behavior. Upon reviewing the results, the prison psychiatrist had diagnosed him with a variety of mental illnesses, including bipolar disorder, clinical depression, and borderline personality disorder. Despite his obvious need for some sort of therapeutic intervention, these ominous findings were filed away and all but forgotten. Though it had been established that Sells was a powder keg waiting to explode, he was released upon completion of his sentence with no provisions put in place to manage his mental health. A free man once again, he had hit the road in search of his own brand of therapy. On December 9, 1991, a Florida woman and her young daughter were killed during a home invasion. Autopsies revealed that 25-year-old Teresa Hall and 5-year-old Tiffany had both died from blunt force trauma to the head. An investigation into the murders found that the perpetrator had gained entry to the house by kicking in the front door. Once inside, he had demolished a heavy wooden table and used the legs to beat the life out of the helpless occupants. On May 13, 1992, a 19-year-old woman in Charleston, West Virginia named Fabian Witherspoon had spotted a man standing near a highway overpass holding a sign that read will work for food. Sympathizing with the bedraggled vagrant's plight, she had pulled over and offered to take him to her place and pack him a nice lunch. Believing that it was her Christian duty to help out someone in need, it hadn't dawned on her at the time that she may have been putting herself in harm's way. She would find out soon enough that no good deed goes unpunished. When they arrived at her apartment, Fabian had told the man to wait on the stoop while she went inside and prepared a to-go bag. She had then retreated to the kitchen, closing the door behind her. As she was busy making his sandwiches, Fabian had turned around to see that the man was now standing in the living room watching her every move. Though his presence had made her feel a bit uneasy, the fear hadn't set in just yet. Rather than acknowledging him, she had continued fixing his lunch as if nothing was wrong. The next thing she knew, the man had rushed towards her, grabbing a knife from the countertop along the way. Realizing instantly that she was in trouble, she had made a mad dash for the bathroom. The man, who was later identified as Tommy Lynn Sells, had chased her down and attempted to rape her on the bathroom floor. In her desperation, Fabian had smashed her attacker over the head with a ceramic duck that sat atop the toilet tank. The blow had been so forceful that it had thrown Cells off balance, causing him to drop the knife. Seizing on the opportunity, Fabian had scrambled to grab the weapon before he could retrieve it. Fully aware that she was in the fight of her life, she had stabbed wildly at her attacker, hitting him several times in the midsection. Stunned by the unexpected turn of events, Cells had struck Fabian over the head with a stool. He had then staggered out the door and headed to the nearest emergency room. Fabian, who had suffered head trauma as well as numerous defensive wounds to her hands, had immediately phoned 911. The responding officers had taken down her incredible account while they waited for paramedics to arrive. 
Sal's, who had sustained penetrating wounds to his liver and kidneys, was confined to the intensive care unit for several days. As a precaution, an armed guard was stationed outside his door for the duration of his stay. When he was well enough to be released, Sal's was taken into custody for the attack on Fabienne. When the case went to court, he claimed that he had simply been waiting for a sandwich when she jumped him for no reason. As the legal wrangling wore on, Sells agreed to plead guilty to malicious wounding in exchange for a sentence of 2 to 10 years behind bars. While in prison, he began corresponding with a woman from Tennessee named Nora Price. Proving that there is someone for everyone, the unlikely pair had fallen in love and gotten married. Upon Sells' release in 1997, the happy couple had settled in Nora's home state, but the union didn't last long. Incapable of caring for others in a meaningful way, the groom's indifference had caused the relationship to sour. Within months of the nuptials, Sels was back on the road and more dangerous than ever. After Fabian had unexpectedly turned the tables on him, he decided that he would make sure to choose his victims more carefully in the future. A coward through and through, the experience had taught him a valuable lesson, namely that although he enjoyed hurting others, he didn't like being on the receiving end. On the night of October 13, 1997, 10-year-old Joel Kirkpatrick was stabbed to death in his bedroom in Lawrenceville, Illinois. His mother, Julie Ray Harper, who had been jolted awake by her son's cries, had run to his aid. She later told police that she had fought with the attacker, who had fled the residence on foot. According to Harper, her son's killer had worn a ski mask that had obscured his face. Investigators determined that the murder weapon was a steak knife that was missing from a butcher block in the kitchen. With no signs of an intruder to be found, detectives questioned Julie's version of events. After putting their heads together and concluding that Julie wasn't the grief-stricken mother she made herself out to be, authorities charged her with Joel's murder. After weighing the evidence put before them, a jury found her guilty as charged and recommended that she spend the rest of her life in prison. Nine years later, Sells would tell investigators in Texas that he had stalked a woman and her young son after running into them at a grocery store in Illinois. He recalled that he had decided to follow them home after the mother was rude to him, drawing his ire. After loitering outside until he was sure they had turned in for the night, he had broken into the house. After finding a kitchen knife that perfectly suited his needs, he had snuck into the boy's bedroom and stabbed him repeatedly. When the woman burst into the room and started attacking him, a struggle had ensued. Wrongly assuming that the police were on their way, he had broken free and made a run for it. The details of his story had so closely matched the murder of Joel Kirkpatrick that Julie's conviction was ultimately overturned, and she was freed from custody. On October 15, 1997, the body of 13-year-old Stephanie Mahaney was discovered floating in a pond in Springfield, Missouri which happened to be one of Sell's favorite stomping grounds. He would later confess to having taken her from her bed as her family slept. He had then drugged and raped the teen before strangling her to death and dumping her body in the shallow water. Two months later, 19-year-old Yvette Sophia Mueller went missing from an RV park in Las Vegas. Sells would subsequently confess to kidnapping, raping, murdering and dismembering a young woman fitting her description and dumping the remains near the Snake River. Since her body was never found, she is still listed today as a missing person, despite the claims of her alleged killer. A 40-year-old carnival worker named Thomas Brose was found shot to death in his caravan on April 1, 1998. Witnesses who were acquainted with both men came forward to say that they had seen the victim in the company of Tommy Lynn Sells on what turned out to be the last day of his life. In April of 1999, 31-year-old Deborah Harris was raped and stabbed to death in her Gibson, Tennessee home. Her 8-year-old daughter Ambria Halliburton, who witnessed the attack, was also killed. Less than two weeks after the double homicide in Gibson, Nine-year-old Mary Beatrice Perez was snatched in broad daylight from an outdoor music festival in San Antonio, Texas after getting separated from her parents. Her brutalized body was found discarded in a creek bed ten days later. The little girl had been raped before being strangled with her own shirt. The next name to be added to the long list of suspected victims of Tommy Lynn Sells was that of Haley McCone, 13, who was kidnapped from a playground in Lexington, Kentucky on May 23, 1999. 
Her remains were found dumped in a wooded area 10 days later. Much like Mary Beatrice Perez, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death with the shirt she was wearing that day. Two months later, on July 5, 14-year-old Bobby Lynn Wofford accepted a ride home from a convenience store in Kingfisher, Oklahoma from a bearded stranger. Her killer would later confess that he had taken her to a remote area where he had beaten and raped her. When she tried to flee, he had chased her down and struck her with a hatchet before shooting her, execution style, in the head. Cell's lock would finally run out on December 31, 1999, in the Texas border town of Del Rio. In the days leading up to the heinous acts that would be his undoing, he had weaseled his way into the good graces of the parents of 13-year-old Katie Harris after meeting them at a community church event. Upon learning that he was having marital difficulties being the good people they were, Terry and Crystal Harris had invited him to their home for counseling. They couldn't know that their act of kindness would be repaid with more heartache than they ever thought possible. On New Year's Eve, knowing that Terry was out of town, Cells had broken into the family's trailer. As Katie and her 10-year-old friend Crystal Searles were sleeping soundly in their bunk beds, Cells had crept into their room and waged a vicious attack upon the teenager. As he ripped off Katie's pajamas and attempted to rape her at knife point, she managed to wiggle free and make a break for the door. When he caught up to her, an infuriated Cells had slashed her twice across the throat. As she lay on the floor gasping for air, he had stabbed her until she fell silent. Awakened by the commotion, a petrified crystal had remained frozen in place. When he approached her, knife in hand, she had begged for her life, promising that she wouldn't tell anyone what she had seen. Unmoved by her pleas, he had callously sliced her throat from ear to ear. Believing that both girls were dead, Sals had fled into the night. When she was certain that he was no longer in the room, a critically wounded Crystal, fearful that he was still inside the residence, had run next door for help. Upon seeing the child standing on their porch covered in blood, the neighbors had called police. When officers arrived on the scene, they found Katie deceased on the bedroom floor. Crystal, however, had miraculously survived the attack. What's more, in spite of the trauma she had endured, she remembered everything with perfect clarity. With Crystal's help, a police sketch artist was able to create a composite drawing of the perpetrator. After taking one look at the face of the man who had killed their daughter, the Harrises identified the culprit as a used car salesman with a troubled marriage named Tommy Lynn Sells. When he was apprehended two days later, Sells had freely admitted to murdering Katie and he didn't stop there. Once the floodgates were open, he would admit to having committed dozens of rapes and unsolved homicides spanning several states. Even though he had taken credit for killings from one end of the country to the other, for reasons known only to him, he denied harming Crystal. Perhaps he couldn't admit to cutting the throat of a child who, though no bigger than a minute, had put an end to his killing spree once and for all. His murderous ways prompted some members of the press to dub him the coast-to-coast -coast killer. Others referred to him as the family annihilator, owing to his penchant for killing women and children during home invasions. When Cell's murder trial got underway in September of 2000, a still-recovering Crystal had somehow found the strength to testify against her assailant. In a voice that seldom rose above a whisper, she had recounted the events of that terrible night when she had watched her friend being killed, knowing that she would be next. In addition to Crystal's eyewitness account of what happened, crime scene investigators had taken the stand to say that Katie's blood had been found on Cell's at the time of his arrest. Likewise, Traces of his DNA were recovered from her body, indicating that he had bled on her during the frenzied attack. Following closing arguments, the jury had deliberated for less than two hours before finding Sells guilty of the crime of capital murder. Though the twelve men and women tasked with determining his fate had no prior knowledge of the defendant's criminal history, they learned during the penalty phase that he was a suspect in a number of other slayings. Upon weighing all their options, they recommended that he be put to death. The judge agreed, ordering that he die by lethal injection. Sell's defense lawyers appealed the verdict on the grounds that jurors had been allowed to see Katie's autopsy photos. They argued that the grisly images had prejudiced them against their client. In 2003, an appeals court dismissed the motion. 
his legal options having run their course, the convicted killer would sit on death row at Huntsville Prison for the next 14 years awaiting his date with destiny. As his execution date grew near, Sell's legal team had requested a stay on the grounds that one of the drugs used in the procedure had a high probability of being contaminated, which might cause their client undue suffering. After giving the matter their careful consideration, the United States Supreme Court denied the motion. On April 3, 2014, Tommy Lynn Sells, age 49, was put to death by the state of Texas for the murder of Kayleen Harris. When asked if he had any last words, he had declined to speak. Several family members of his other victims had witnessed the execution. Crystal Searles, one of only two known survivors, had been on hand that day to make sure that the man who still haunted her nightmares would never harm her, or anyone else, ever again. Whether the injections were painful or not, which had worried him no end, is unknown. One thing, however, is certain, he received far more humane treatment than his victims, all of whom had died screaming. Though Tommy Lynn Sells had become what law enforcement officers refer to as a professional confessor in the weeks and months after his capture, it's impossible to know the accuracy of his claims. While some murders, such as that of Joel Kirkpatrick, were considered solved thanks to his confession, others remain in doubt. Even so, it's estimated that he likely killed upwards of 70 people during the years he spent roaming the highways and byways of the United States. Authorities suspected that Sells, who would often seek temporary employment at towing companies, had used his position to abduct, rape and ultimately murder stranded motorists, mostly women traveling alone. Since he was the only one who knew of their plight, it would have been easy for him to take them from point A to point B without anyone being the wiser. When the drivers in distress were men or large groups that he didn't think he could handle, he would tow their vehicle and they would all live to see another day. Sells had made no secret of the fact that he targeted women and children simply because they were less likely to fight back. He boasted that his favorite method of murder was strangulation, since it allowed him to see the fear in the eyes of his victims when they realized that they were going to die. That being said, he would change things up occasionally and resort to bludgeoning his quarry or stabbing them with knives taken from the kitchens of the homes he invaded. A killer who was as cold-blooded as they come, Sells had once told an interviewer that using a knife to end the life of a human being had come as naturally to him as peeling an orange or slicing a tomato. As for how he gained access to the homes of his victims, he explained that he normally entered through unlocked windows. He would also kick in doors if he was sure that no males were present in the home. Having learned from experience that the element of surprise worked in his favor, he knew that by the time the residents were aware of what was happening, they were powerless to do anything about it. Like many of his ilk, Sells consistently blamed the victims for their own deaths. He would invariably recall that they had deliberately insulted him, tried to steal from him or committed some other imaginary slight that had driven him to end their lives. In some instances, fancying himself a vigilante, he claimed that he had killed one party to protect another, usually a child. Bearing in mind that he had willingly admitted to the senseless slaughter of numerous youngsters, including a newborn infant, authorities dismissed this excuse as utter nonsense. A heartless killer whose hatred for everyone and everything had led him to commit atrocious crimes against the most innocent of victims, Tommy Lynn Sells was the boogeyman come to life. His reign of terror illustrated that the horrifying entities we conjure in our minds are nothing compared to the real-life monsters that walk among us. Richard Chase Richard Trenton Chase was born May 23, 1950, in Santa Clara, California. His childhood was unstable as his father, a strict disciplinarian, and his mother were prone to constant bicker. There are conflicting reports whether or not he was abused as a child, specifically by his mother, but these are mostly unsupported as the worst anyone has ever said concerning Richard's upbringing and his parents was that his father could at times be a little too strict on the young boy. Although his parents' quarrels would eventually lead them to divorce, it seems by most accounts that Richard was loved and supported by his parents. Keeping in mind that slapping a child was much more accepted in the 1950s and 1960s than today, it is fair to assess that Richard was most probably slapped around a bit, but there is no evidence to show that any physical abuse of a more extreme nature ever took place. Though Richard was not physically abused to any extent deemed as abuse for the era, 
One could speculate that the fact that his parents used him against each other early in the divorce process could be considered psychological abuse and might have accelerated the mental illnesses already festering in him. Young Richard is what one would consider to be an unusual child by most. Since childhood he had increasing problems taking baths and never cleaned after himself whatsoever. That he liked to live in his own filth should maybe have caught his parents' attention, but if it did they found a solution to this problem and it would carry on until his adult years. His early bizarreness was enhanced by the fact that when he was left alone in the house he would turn the heat up in the house to near 100 degrees, as high as he could get it, remove all his clothes and lie on the living room floor, sweltering in the heat. It was also a childhood that he began to feel worried about not having enough blood in his body, a problem which he would never find a solution to. Another factor that didn't help his development was that he exhibited traits complying with the McDonnell Triad, a set of three behavioral characteristics suggesting that all three or a combination of two can more strongly predict a future tendency to violence and or serial offenses, by being a bedwetter over the age of five, having predisposition to start fires, and torture, mutilate and kill animals. The latter being one of Richard's great passions as he engaged in this behavior to an excessive amount, even for a future serial killer. When Richard was 10 years old, his mother confided in a neighbor that she had found a dead cat buried in her flower box. This neighbor later recalled that she remembered a lot of cats going missing from the neighborhood while the Chase family lived there, though the specific number of missing cats is unknown. Even though he was a complicated young man, he didn't experience too much difficulty in his teen years. According to statements from his peers from his high school days, Richard was popular both socially and romantically, which isn't very common in serial killers as most experience an alienated adolescence. Though he didn't have much trouble getting friends or dates in his early teens, it became a different matter when puberty hit and he realized that he was impotent when it came to sexual relations with girls, which caused him great frustration. The rumor about his impotence spread quickly in his hometown, something that must have been immensely embarrassing and frustrating, not to mention traumatizing to young Richard. These rumors, along with his developing schizophrenia and his growing frustration, caused him to become obsessed with his impotence. In high school Richard learned that in order for a man to get an erection, blood is needed to rush into the penis, filling the flaccid member and making it erect following arousal. Because of this, and further augmented by his yet not diagnosed schizophrenia, Richard, who had already considered himself to be deficient of blood since childhood, became even more worried. As these thoughts continued to grow and expand, he soon became convinced that the problem with his impotence was directly linked with his lack of blood. This delusion soon led him to believe that if he were to drink blood he could fill his body, and therefore also fill his penis, with blood and no longer suffer the humiliation he had endured sexually. And so the first seed of a dangerous obsession was sown and would soon cultivate into something all the more horrific. Richard's first attempt to fill his body with what he considered much-needed blood came from a kitten he had gotten from his then-girlfriend's house. Richard most likely stole the kitten and took it home. Desperate to find a solution to his predicament, he brought the small feline to the back of the house where he killed it and drank the blood straight from the animal. Finding that it did not help with his impotence, he went on to larger prey. Soon after murdering the cat, Richard shot and killed a white dog named Sabbath before he tried to collect the blood pouring out of the holes with a Dixie cup. These would be his first ventures into the horrible world of blood consumption, but far from his last. Around the age of 18, Richard went to a psychiatrist concerning his obsession with blood, though one can only speculate whether or not he admitted to drinking the blood of animals in any of his sessions. But since psychology was far from as advanced in the late 1960s as it is now, if might be fair to assume that had he confessed this to his doctor, his doctor might not have been too worried about his animal abuse either way. It is around this time that his psychological problems escalated from being only about blood to what he believed to be other bodily abnormalities, one of which included Richard's belief that his stomach was put in backwards and that his cranium was changing in shape. What we do know is that in these sessions with his psychiatrist Richard did tell him about his impotence problems and how he thought they were related to his blood deficiency, but his psychiatrist told him that suppressed anger was the most probable cause, specifically anger directed towards women. Russian serial killer Andrei Chikatilo, the butcher of Rostov, 
was another serial killer who suffered from impotence and was actually unable to achieve an erection without being soaked in blood after committing violent acts. We can conclude that Richard's psychiatrist didn't put him at ease or help him understand how to solve his dire dilemma. Though it is clear that Richard Chase suffered from schizophrenia as he displayed many schizophrenic symptoms and tendencies, he also had a few other traits that we often see in serial killers. From pathological lying, not being embarrassed or ashamed when being caught in a lie, to theft and showing no remorse for his actions when caught in the act, which he was many times, goes to show that his case is one of several layers and factors. After a stint enrolled in the American River College, where Richard managed to maintain a steady C grade average while consistently using drugs, he moved out from his parents' house at age 21 and moved in with two female roommates, one of which he knew from high school, while the other one he had met since graduating. Richard had not improved with personal hygiene and the two girls that lived with him described him as a filthy human being who flat out refused to take a shower and never washed his clothes. When he first moved in with the girls, he was already showing obvious irregularities from what one would refer to as normal, but he still had some friends at the time. The 1970s, in particular the hippie culture, had done much to make what was considered normal etiquette more lenient and Richard's erratic behavior was more easily camouflaged. His obsession with drugs, particularly weed and acid, that had begun in high school escalated in his adulthood and he would go on to start selling, becoming a small-time drug dealer, something that most probably made it easier for him to keep relations. While living with the girls, his obsession with drugs accelerated and he became a hardcore drug user, something that only made the imbalance in his already imbalanced, schizophrenic mind even more unstable and unpredictable. One night in the apartment Richard boarded up his bedroom door, locked himself in the closet of his bedroom and boarded the door up, refusing to come out. When he was later asked why he did it, he said that people were sneaking up on him from inside. Another time, he walked out of his bedroom completely nude and started talking nonsense to his roommates. The female roommates grew more and more afraid of Richard's erratic behavior and soon became too afraid to ask him to leave, instead opting to leave themselves, abandoning the apartment and leaving Richard on his own. Left alone, Richard's delusions about various parts of his anatomy being wrong or abnormal continued to intensify. As well as still believing that his stomach was turned backwards and bones were growing out the back of his head, he would eventually shave his head in order to keep an eye on this imagined cranial growth, he also began to tell people that his heart would periodically stop beating for short periods of time. That Richard was obsessed with anatomy books didn't do much to help his state of mind as he continually became more convinced that it was his body that was the ones with complications, not his psyche. The book's pictures must have pushed his fixations with his morphing body and schizophrenia over the top. A short time after the girls moved out, Richard, unable to pay the whole rent on his own, lost the apartment and was forced to live with his recently separated parents. At this time Richard knew that something was wrong with him, he knew that he didn't fit into society, but found himself with nowhere to go, which put his mother and father in a difficult position. Between his fixation with the faults of his body and his continued compulsion to drink animal blood, as well as his refusal to clean himself or wash his clothes, he was very difficult to live with, which is the primary reason that his mother and father would bounce him back and forth between them. In April of 1973, Chase was attending a friend's apartment party where he fondled a girl and was asked to leave. When he returned to the apartment shortly after, the police were called and soon arrived to escort him out. As they escorted him out a .22 caliber gun fell from his belt and he was sent to jail. His father bailed him out and the following month, in May, he moved to LA to live with his grandmother. Here, we assumed that Richard had a very uneventful year driving developmentally disabled kids back and forth to the school that his grandmother helped at. Even though he wouldn't move on to human blood for another four years, Richard was nothing short of a terror at home with his grandmother as well as outside during this period. He was constantly in and out of the doctor offices and the mental asylum. He was well monitored for a period of time, but his behavior was finally attributed to just being weird and not dangerous. It is in this turbulent period that Richard once showed up at his mother's house screaming about how people were following him. She was calling the hospital for them to come pick Richard up when he took the phone from his mother and beat her with it. With that violent outburst things came to a head. He had been weird at his grandmother's house, 
but things were getting worse now, and quickly. Amongst the odd things Richard did at this time was that he would wrap his head in towels and saran wrap filled with orange slices. He did this with the belief that he could ingest vitamin C from the fruit this way. His grandmother, no longer able to stand his erratic behavior, sent him back to Sacramento, and shortly after his return he ended up in the American River Hospital where he told doctors that his heart and kidneys had stopped working, his pulmonary artery had been stolen and his blood had stopped flowing completely. He would be admitted to the psychiatric ward and doctors would finally diagnose him as a schizophrenic, 1973-74. They told his mother that he needed treatment and care, but that he was not a danger to himself or others. Because of this, they allowed his mother to have him released and introduce him back into society, which proved to worsen his condition. Out of the American River Hospital Richard got even more delusional and began accusing his mother of poisoning his food as well as controlling his mind. The complaints about his mother were made to an imaginary friend that Richard had created. Though his parents were first-hand witnesses of their son's mental deterioration, further enhanced by aggressive drug use, Richard's parents decided that what was best to do was to give Richard his own apartment. Living on his own Richard would spend his days riding to and back from the local rabbit farm. At the farm he would buy a rabbit, bring it to his apartment where he'd butcher it and then either eat the rabbit raw, in particular the entrails, drink its blood or throw both of it into the blender, liquefying them and guzzling the whole thing down. One can only speculate what the rabbit farm owner thought of Richard as he bought rabbits with such frequency. The vigorous consumption of rabbits was done because Richard now believed that his heart was shrinking and that his heart would disappear if he did not do anything about it, which in this case he concluded eating raw rabbit meat and entrails would help. Richard's condition has been said to be an example of Cotard's syndrome, a psychological illness that leads a person to believe that he or she is a walking corpse, or are alive but rotting from the inside, or are missing important pieces of their anatomy like blood or organs. One night Richard's father came to visit his son and found him sitting on the couch wearing only shorts and looking pale and sick. Richard told his dad that he had bought a bad rabbit and thought he had food poisoning. Richard, aided by his father, went to the hospital where doctors found that he was indeed sick, but not food poisoning but rather from blood poisoning, brought on because he had injected himself with the blood of a rabbit. Richard did this because he thought that he had eaten a rabbit who had eaten battery acid and that battery acid had seeped through the walls of his stomach into his flesh and the only thing that could cure the battery acid stained rabbit blood was clean rabbit blood. After the rabbit acid incident, Richard was committed to a mental institution yet again, but it didn't last more than two days as he escaped by running out through the front door which had been unlocked. The staff caught him soon after and when brought him back they transferred him to a different facility where he earned the nickname Dracula because Richard would constantly talk about blood and killing animals. He once said that he liked killing rabbits because they were like little machines. Impressively, he even continued killing animals while committed in the hospital. One day the staff found him with fresh blood over his face and upon inspecting his room they found birds with their necks broken by his window. He had apparently caught them somehow ripped off their heads and sucked out their blood. When they asked the blood and feather covered Richard what was going on, he told them that he had cut himself shaving. In addition to his other diagnoses, it is likely that Chase suffered from what is now known as Renfield syndrome. Although not included in the DSM-5 list of mental disorders it is an acceptable diagnosis for somebody who is constantly talking about blood, covering themselves in blood and has a compulsion to drink blood. Renfield syndrome has three stages. The first one is when the patients cut themselves and drink their own blood. The second is the zoophagia stage, in which a person consumes the blood of an animal, which includes the drinking of an animal's blood while the animal is still alive. The third stage is moving on to the blood of humans, which Richard would move on to do soon after his release on September 29, 1976. His release was against the strong disapproval of everyone on the staff except from Richard's doctor, who said that Richard had good socialization and had gotten a realistic view of his problem. It is largely believed that Richard's mother was an influence in his release as she had a strong sense of denial when concerning his son's illness. Richard's mother would often visit the facility, telling the doctors that he didn't belong in there and that she could take better care of him. 
When Richard was released in September, he lived with his mother for a couple of days before becoming too much for her to handle and being sent to live in his apartment again. Following his release, his mother also felt it right to wean him off his medication because she didn't think that he needed it. She said that they, the medication, made Richard walk around like a zombie, something she didn't like. Being the 1970s, the medicine prescribed to schizophrenics were very strong medications that not only removed the delusions, but blocked the flow of dopamine into the brain which fuels the schizophrenia, making the patients often zombie-like. Somewhere in the beginning on 1977, his parents allowed the court-ordered conservatorship to expire and Richard became responsible for his own livelihood. Still thinking she was aiding her son, Richard's mother helped him plan a three-week trip to Washington and gave him $1,450. In Washington, Chase bought a 1966 Ford Ranchero for $800 from a man in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, a car that would facilitate his thirst for blood. On August 1977, the true unstable thoughts in Richard's mind were unleashed. He was off his medication, living on his own in an apartment his parents were paying the rent for and barely checking up on him, his own mother kept telling him that nothing was wrong with him and that the medications were not needed, and with Richard tormented by his own delusions and compulsions stemming from his aggressive illness soon proved to be the recipe for disaster. On August 3, 1977, tribal police were called out after a car had been reported abandoned near Pyramid Lake, near the Walker River Reservation in Nevada. Upon arriving they found a 1966 Ford Ranchero with a bumper sticker that said I'd rather be flying stuck in the sand. Inside the car they found a loaded 30 30 rifle and a .22 rifle, both of them stained with blood. Near the guns was a pair of bloody tennis shoes and a pile of blood-soaked clothes. On the floor of the car, on a pool of fresh blood, there was a white plastic bucket with a liver inside. Using their binoculars, the tribal police spotted Richard Chase, naked, perched on a large rock about a half mile away. When the officers approached him, Richard reportedly took off like a shot, but was soon caught by a police officer on an ATV. Once he was caught they saw that Richard was literally covered in blood, with blood smeared under his armpits and even poured into his ears. When the police asked him where the blood came from he told them that it was seeping from him. Chase was taken to the station for questioning. At the police station they figured out that the liver had been taken from a cow and not a human. He was arrested nonetheless and his car was impounded, but because the U.S. attorney didn't press charges he was let go. Had the police checked his records and seen just how many times he had been checked into mental hospitals, they most likely would have held him longer and he might have been committed again. The fact that Richard might have been under the influence of drugs could be a possible explanation for him being released as the police might have blamed his crazy behavior on the drugs. In October of 1977, Richard bought and stole a few dogs which he killed and presumably drank the blood of. It would be no more than two months later that Richard Chase would go on to commit his first human murder. On December 2nd, Richard Chase bought a gun for $69 which he would not be able to pick up before December 18th so his credentials could be verified. This purchase tapped out all his funds so he asked his mother to buy him a holster for it, but when she said no he stole the holster from a thrift store. That his mother allowed him to own a gun with everything she knew about his unbalanced mind is negligent at best and straight out moronic at worst. On why Richard's murderous thirst escalate to such a degree around this time might be because his parents decided that they would not allow him to spend Christmas at home that year. Upon learning this, Richard allegedly shot the family cat through the head in front of his mother and proceeded to smear blood all over himself. His mother allegedly told his father about what had happened, though she left out the part where Richard smeared the animal's blood all over himself. His parents then decided that he could no longer be in the house and had to reside in his own apartment. A couple of days after that incident Richard cut his hair, shaved, began to dress better and told his parents that he was feeling better. He also told them that he was thinking about starting to look for a job. But while his parents thought that Richard was finding more stable ground and was attempting to lead a more normal life, he was in the process of attaining more guns and buying ammo over the next couple of days. This collecting of weapons and ammo might be used as proof to show that he premeditated the murders to come. Being a visionary serial killer, Richard didn't target women or men specifically, 
it was mostly about the blood for him, so either sex would do. Leading up to his first murder, Richard started walking up to people's homes as well stalking them, going into properties and even backyards to ogle at potential victims through their windows. He was going through the process that most serial killers go through, the process of constantly allowing oneself little liberties, which helps to build up the courage and confidence needed in order to move on to murder. December 27, 1977 A woman named Dorothy Polinski was doing her dishes around 6.30 p.m. when she heard a loud pop, followed by the sound of glass breaking. As she reacted to the sound of breaking glass, she felt a streak of heat pass right above her skull. The sensation on her scalp was from a bullet that had passed through the tight bun that Dorothy wore her hair in, before it lodged itself in the back of a kitchen cabinet. Richard's first attempt at murdering of a human being was unsuccessful, but the bullet would match the gun that Richard would use the very next day, on his second attempt. The next day, on December 28, 1977, Chase took his car to the streets of Sacramento with his .22 caliber gun in hand to try again. Not far from where Richard himself lived, he drove by a house where he spotted 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin. Ambrose was unloading groceries from the back of his car, about to carry them inside along with his wife. Two loud pops rang out, stunning them both. Reacting to the sound, his wife turned around just in time to see her husband slump to the ground. The first bullet had missed Ambrose completely, but a second bullet had hit him right in the chest, killing him. After the murder of Ambrose Griffin, Richard went home and watched television for the rest of the day, TV being one of his favorite pastimes. With Ambrose being a completely random killing, the Sacramento police didn't have any clues to who the perpetrator might have been. The next day, in a weird turn of event, the police decided to bring in a psychic after a 12-year-old reported that a man in his mid-twenties had attempted to shoot at him from a brown Pontiac Trans AM. The boy couldn't remember any other details than that and therefore the psychic was brought to the case in a very bizarre decision by the police. After a long psychic session, the boy recalled a license plate number 219 EP, but as we now know, Richard Chase had a Ford Ranchero and the plate did not match the number, leaving the lead to go nowhere and thus allowing Richard to get away with the murder of Ambrose Griffin. Between the first and the second murder, Richard was institutionalized for paranoid schizophrenia yet again where he continued to complain that his head kept changing shape and that someone had stolen his pulmonary artery, but he was again soon released for undisclosed reasons. Unfortunately, the short stint institutionalized did nothing to stop Richard's growing bloodlust. Don Larson, a neighbor of Chase's, saw the young man bring home three animals on three different occasions in this period, two dogs and one cat, and she never saw any of the animals again. It has been stated that he bought so many animals from local pet shops that he was placed on a no-selling list after none of the animals he bought were ever seen again. It is a common myth that animals have a sixth sense, and the fact animals would recoil from chase and dogs would often bark at him when he walked down the street might support for that belief. No longer able to buy animals from pet stores, Richard stole a puppy, killed it and drank its blood. After the atrocious act, he called up the owner he had stolen the puppy from and proceeded to tell how he had killed and cut open the dog. This behalf our strays from the theory that Richard murdered animals and humans purely for the delusional necessity of needing their blood, it is clear that Richard got some morbid pleasure from psychological torment as well. On January 23, 1978, Richard decided it was time to get up close and personal with his first human blood victim. He began walking on 2909, Bernie Street, strolling up to the house of a woman named Jean Leeton. He tried getting in via the patio door, but the door was locked so he moved onto the windows. The windows were also locked so he moved onto the back door where Jean, who had already spotted him, was staring at him through the window. Face to face through the glass, Jean would later say that he stared at her with no emotion, as if he was looking at a car he was thinking about buying. Unable to enter her home, Richard lit a cigarette and walked away from her house, continuing down the street. About half an hour later, Richard entered the unlocked house of Robert and Barbara Edwards. Years later, Richard told FBI profiler Robert Ressler that when he went out to murder he only went to houses that were unlocked, not because it was easier but because he thought that locked houses meant that he was not welcome a play on the mythology that vampires cannot enter without being invited in. 
When Robert and Barbara came home from grocery shopping they opened the door and found the filthy and scraggly looking Richard Chase standing in the hallway. Robert and Barbara spotted Richard and chased him around the house for a short while before Richard finally got past them and ran out the front door. As Richard was running from the Edwards house and they screamed for him to stop, he apparently screamed back that he was taking a shortcut. When they inspected their house they soon understood that Richard had intended to steal a few things as they found a bag full of items such as rings, a tape player, a decorative dagger and a stethoscope. They also found that Richard had left something behind. When the couple walked into their baby's bedroom, they found that Richard had opened the chest of drawers and urinated on all the baby's clothes. He had also defecated on the infant's bed. A few serial murderers, among them Albert Fish, have left fecal matter behind as it is a sign of power, literally defecating on their victims or on something they cherish. The Edwards called the police, but since it was the 70s, a time with many hippies walking around doing drugs, acting odd and often filthy, it is believed that the police didn't take it as seriously as they maybe should have. After the break-in attempt, Richard was thirsty and went to a store to grab himself his favorite drink, an orange soda. While at the store, he ran into an old classmate of his, Nancy Holden. Chase walked up to her and said, were you on the motorcycle when Kurt was killed? Because that would have been fucking awesome. Although Nancy had in fact dated a guy named Kurt, who had in fact died in a motorcycle accident, Nancy was understandably freaked out by the question, not the least because she barely recognized Chase as he was filthy, smelled bad, skinnier than he had been when she had known him, and was wearing a bright orange ski parka which was covered in brown stains that were most definitively dried up blood. Nancy soon broke free from the uncomfortable conversation but Richard followed her outside, asking Nancy for a ride. Nancy managed to get in her car start the engine and drive off just as Richard was about to open the passenger side door. Though we don't know what intentions Richard had with Nancy Holden, it is fair to assume that little good could have come out of the situation had Richard been given a ride as he had his .22 in his shoulder holster the entire time. By chance Richard noticed a blue van in the grocery store parking lot after Nancy drove away. Still bloodthirsty after failing to hitch a ride with Nancy Holden, Richard landed on murder at 2360 Tioga Way. We do know that at this point his motive was no longer robbery because a blue van was parked in the driveway, clearly proving that someone was home. We don't know exactly why he chose this house in particular, though a possible explanation, if there is one, is that Richard recognized the van from the store parking lot, the same store where his soon-to-be 22-year-old victim Teresa Wallen had visited about an hour before Richard showed up at her house. It is therefore possible that Richard, deep in the webs of schizophrenia at this point, saw the blue van as a symbol and because of that he chose that specific house. But being the textbook definition of a disorganized serial killer, it could have been a random act, and the blue van merely a coincidence. Richard walked up to the front yard, took his .22 caliber handgun from his leather shoulder holster, cocked it, ejected a bullet and put it to Reese's mailbox before he walked up to the house and opened the unlocked door. In the hall he found Teresa on her way out with a bag of garbage. When Richard pointed his gun at Teresa she dropped the bag and put up her hands. That's when Richard began firing. The first bullet entered her palm, traveled up her arm, exited through the elbow and nicked her neck. The second bullet went through the top part of her skull, killing her, and she dropped to the ground. Richard then walked up to her and fired one more bullet into her temple from six inches away, which was a mercy considering what was to come. As well as being a disorganized killer, Richard also falls under the category of a product killer as his intention was to kill people as fast as possible because it was not so much about the thrill of the murder but rather what he could do with the body afterwards. He didn't want to struggle, he wanted immediate control of the situation, especially considering that he was a short, thin and scrawny man. Richard picked up Teresa's body by the shoulders and dragged her to the bedroom leaving a long dark streak of blood on the floor. After he'd laid her down, he walked back to the kitchen where he got a knife. In the hall he picked up an empty yogurt cup out of the garbage that Teresa had dropped and brought it back to the bedroom where he started working on the body. First her pulled her sweater over her shoulders and cut off her left nipple. He then stabbed her torso so hard he split open her sternum. He sliced the left side of her stomach open, 
reached inside the wound and pulled out the intestines until the organs were exposed before he stabbed the organs eight times, stabbing so deep that the knife came out through her back. The only organs he left unscathed were the kidneys. He then used the empty yogurt cup to gather blood from Teresa's stomach cavity and drink much of it before he went to the bathroom and smeared his face and hands with the more of Teresa's blood. The final disgrace of the body came when Chase walked out of the house and picked up a pile of dog feces from the yard which he shoved into Teresa's mouth. But maybe worst of all was that when it was performed an autopsy on Teresa it was discovered that she had been six weeks pregnant at the time of her death. He left Teresa's house still covered in blood and walked to his apartment that was very close by, where he again spent the rest of the day watching TV. It would be Teresa's husband who would find her disgraced body. Like with most serial murders, police had no immediate leads on the murder of Teresa Wallen. Because the majority of murders are committed by a person the victim knows, it was very difficult to know where to begin looking after such a random murder. Though that is not to say that Sacramento PD didn't try and particularly Lt. Ray Biondi, who would go on to write the book The Vampire Killer about Richard Chase. The only clues the police had was a set of footprints in a pool of Teresa's blood, the bullet that ended her life and the one in the mailbox, and a series of ring stains that appeared to have been made by a pan or a bucket set on the floor. These ring stains imply that Richard either brought his own bucket or took a bucket from the kitchen. Since Richard was most likely not organized enough to bring a bucket himself it is believed that he found it in the house. As early as a few days later it is possible that Richard might have begun looking for his next victim as he went door to door asking for old magazines, specifically back issues of Mad Magazine and Cosmopolitan. Though it is impossible to say with certainty whether he was looking for his next victim or if he was acting on schizophrenic impulses. Seeing as Richard's behavior, as well as his look, was unusual in the neighborhood, a few of the neighbors reported to the police that they'd seen him walking from house to house. Later that same month, a couple called the police after they found one of their Labrador puppies dead on their rear patio. The pup had been shot and had its stomach ripped open. When the police asked if they had seen any strange people, they told the police about a skinny, filthy man in an orange jacket who had bought two puppies from them a few days prior. Lieutenant Biondi, acting on a hunch, and remembering the reports people had made about the magazine hunter that fit the same description, ordered an autopsy on the little pup and found fragments of a .22 bullet. It wasn't enough to match it to the wall and murder, but it was still a clue, though it wouldn't be enough to catch Richard before he committed one of the worst and most blood-soaked killing sprees in American history. Despite the police's hard work and tireless efforts, Richard Chase would claim for more victims before they would even know name. Evelyn Miroth was 38 years old, a single mother of two boys Vernon, 13 years old and Jason, 6 years old, who lived in the Country Club Center neighborhood of Sacramento. On January 27, Evelyn was home with her son Jason and her sister-in-law's 20-month-old baby boy, David Ferreira. On that day, Evelyn had planned to send her 6-year-old son to play in the snow at the foot of the Sierra Nevada mountains along with a neighbor, but the plan would never come to fruition because of Richard Chase. At 9.05 a.m., Evelyn's friend Danny Meredith came over to the house in a red station wagon. Once there, Evelyn asked him if he could drive out and rent some snowshoes for Jason to take on the trip, something to which Danny happily obliged. Not long after Danny left the house, Chase entered the home through an unlocked back door. He proceeded into the bathroom where Evelyn was taking a bath and quickly shot her in the head, killing her instantly. He had done the deed quickly and cowardly in order to avoid a struggle, just like he had done with Teresa Wallen. Once Evelyn was dead, Richard dragged her naked body out of the bathroom and into her bedroom, where he laid her on the bed. What happened next is not known in detail, but it is presumed that six-year-old Jason heard the gunshot and came into the bedroom just as Richard was laying his mother on the bed. Richard shot the young boy twice in the head at close range and left the body on the floor. He then got a knife from the kitchen in order to repeat the atrocities he had subjected Teresa Wallen to, but was interrupted when the front door swung open. It was Danny Meredith back with the snowshoes for Jason. Chase walked out of the kitchen and met Danny in the hall with the .22 caliber ready in his hand. Richard immediately raised his gun and shot Danny between the eyes. 
It is after murdering Danny Meredith that Richard noticed the sounds of the 20-month-old crying infant coming from one of the bedrooms. Following the wails, he found the baby lying in a crib. He pointed the gun at the small head of the baby boy and pulled the trigger. Richard then returned to the bedroom with two carving knives from the kitchen and began to emulate the blood ritual he had performed on the corpse of Teresa Wallen. First he cut open Evelyn's stomach, sternum to navel, then cut again across her belly and pulled out her intestines. He stabbed her deliberately in specific organs, again leaving only the kidneys unscathed. He took out the liver, cut off a piece and ate it. Then he proceeded to pull out the rest of the organs and collected as much blood as he could from the abdomen of Evelyn. Where this murder is different from Teresa's is that Chase decided to take it even further. He rolled Evelyn's body over on its stomach and stabbed the anus six times before he sodomized the wound. He then rolled her back over and sliced her neck open before he carefully cut out one of her eyes. Richard had done all he wanted with the body of Evelyn Miroth, but his work was not done. Richard went back to bedroom where the dead infant was, brought the body back to the bathroom where he split the head open and partially dumped the baby's brains into the bathtub. It was then that a knock came from the front door. The family across the street were still waiting for Jason to come over so they could go on their trip. After waiting for a while and not hearing anything, the mother next door sent her young daughter to check on why it was taking so long. Luckily Richard Chase did not open the door. Instead he waited until the little girl left, took Danny Meredith's keys to the red station wagon and escaped unseen by anyone with a bucket of blood and the body of the 20-month-old baby boy. The crime scene was discovered 30 minutes later when a worried neighbor opened the back door and saw Danny Meredith's corpse lying in the hall. The murder of the two adults, the child and the infant from the time Richard had entered the house to when he escaped had taken a mere 45 minutes. Police were at a loss about who had committed the atrocious murders, but based on the similar styles of mutilations done on the bodies it was easy to assume that the same person who had murdered Teresa Wallen had also committed the mass murder that had just been uncovered. The police also found the same ring imprints they had discovered in the earlier crime scene on the carpet next to one of the bodies, as well as bullets from the same gun. But there were no fingerprints. Richard, in a very sudden move, had worn rubber gloves, thus leaving no fingerprints, which reveals, at least to some extent, his ability to tell right from wrong. In addition to wearing gloves, he had dumped his ranchero truck at the Miroth house and taken Meredith's red station wagon which he drove to another apartment complex, where he parked it, again proving that he knew what he had done was wrong. All of these elements combined were just enough to cast a shadow of a doubt about the insanity defense later on. Police found Meredith's car, but found little to link it to Chase, which is surprising considering that Chase was carrying a bucket of blood and the corpse of an infant. However, they would later find out that Richard had parked the car only 100 yards away from his front door. Most of the time it's a happy accident that killers are caught, Richard Ramirez being a prime example of this, but the situation was not such with Richard Chase. Even though the detectives in this case were either very new detectives or rookie detectives, they did an impressive job capturing the vampire of Sacramento. With no concrete leads, Lt. Biondo decided to try something new that he had learned two years earlier at a seminar hosted by the FBI, Psychological Profiling. Using the techniques he had learned in combination with crime scene evidence and a few hunches, Biondi was able to make a few assumptions. The first assumption was that since no witnesses in the suburban neighborhood could remember having seen any minorities around this being the late 1970s, a time when people would have noticed Biondi could assume that the killer was Caucasian. And since the one suspicious person that did show up in the police reports was this skinny, white male in his 20s wearing an orange jacket, it was safe to assume that that was probably their guy. The second assumption was that he thought that the killer was probably schizophrenic. The crimes were extremely disorganized and occurred in daylight with no real effort to cover the crimes except from the use of gloves. The fact that the crimes had been done with no real regard for witnesses proved that it was obviously an individual who had broken from reality. Thirdly, Biondi concluded that the killer was most probably a loner, unmarried and out of work as no one would be able to live with or employ someone who was capable of doing such atrocious acts as those murders. That the murders had occurred in regular work hours also supported this theory. 
The fourth assumption was that the killer had most probably limited social skills. Biondi could establish from the crime scene that there had not been long interactions with the victims before the murders had been committed, which supported the theory that the perpetrator needed to keep control of the situation and he was not capable of doing this through communication. The fifth assumption was that the perpetrator had probably been recently released from a mental institution based on the nature of the crimes. And since the crimes had occurred only in a small area, Biondi could conclude that the killer was a newcomer to the area. Biondi's profile matched Richard Chase perfectly, and the FBI often holds up the Chase case as the gold standard of a disorganized killer profile. The FBI continues to take credit for Chase being brought in and solving the Richard Chase case, despite the fact that they were not involved in the case in the least something several books and articles about Richard Chase falsely claim. As a citywide search for baby boy David Ferreira was organized, the police continued to question neighbors of the Miroth family and were told the same story about a skinny, filthy man in his 20s wearing an orange ski parka. This was unfortunately not a great help to Biondi as we have already established that the hippie movement had many skinny, dirty, white males walking around Sacramento. Nevertheless, they were able to make a sketch of the filthy man in the parka and send it out. They also knew that the murderer had used a .22 semi-automatic gun, but the problem with this light and the fact that .22 semi-automatics were amongst the most popular guns sold at the time. They were in fact so popular that they were known for their reputation of being murder weapons. The lucky break came when Richard's high school friend Nancy Holden, the one who Richard had harassed at the grocery store and possibly planned to kill on the day of the Wallen murder, told her police officer father-in-law about the incident after seeing the sketch of the scrubby stranger. Following his hunches, Biondi started looking into Richard Chase's file specifically and found that he had a concealed weapons arrest, which alone would have been enough for the police to look into it, but he also noticed that Chase had spent time in a mental institution where he was described as a violent patient. This confirmed a few points of Biondi's FBI profile, but more convincingly Richard's file also had information about the blood incident at Pyramid Lake, which confirmed a fascination with blood clearly evident in the crime scenes. Detectives soon found out where Richard lived, drove over and knocked on the door, but Richard didn't answer. They were certain he was inside because they could hear him, but not wanting to compromise the scene by entering without a warrant, the officers made a big show of acting like they were going to leave and return later. The officers left the building and decided to wait for him by the corner. Sure enough their elaborate scene managed to trick Richard as he was soon spotted walking outside carrying a cardboard box. When the officers yelled for him to stop, chased through the box at one of the officers and a whole collection of bloody pieces of paper flew out at the box. All that was in fact in the box were little, bloody pieces of paper. Chase took off in one direction with one officer going after him, while the other officer came around the other corner and bashed him in the head with his gun when Chase appeared. Richard immediately fell to the ground and the officer thought he may have killed him as he lay completely still. But when he went down to put the cuffs on him, Richard started wiggling and jerking around. The officer later stated that Richard was trying to reach into his jacket to get the gun out and he had to throw himself over him in order to keep him from doing so. The officer was in a bind, he couldn't get to his own gun while holding Richard down, and was struggling to keep Richard's arms away from his weapon. Luckily the other officer arrived before Richard managed to reach his gun and they finally got the cuffs on him. With Richard secure, they searched him and in his back pocket they found Danny Meredith's wallet. In his shoulder holster was the .22 semi-automatic which further went to show that they had the right man. But most disturbing of all is that they also found pictures of Evelyn and Jason Miroth in his pocket. Richard had apparently stolen the photographs from the house after the murder. When the police got a warrant for Richard's apartment, they discovered a scene that was nothing less of grotesque. Almost everything in the apartment was stained with either dried or fresh blood, down to a low French bread that was on the couch. Next to the couch was Richard's blood-soaked sleeping bag. There were small pieces of bones in the kitchen, and in the fridge they found the body parts of animals on dishes as well as human brain tissue stored in a container. His blender was also badly stained and smelled of rotting flesh. They also found anatomy textbooks, health magazines, a marked-up psychology article titled UNDERSTIMULATION, a classified section with all the ads for dogs circled and a spiral notebook. 
The notebook had been filled with handwritten notes, drawings of guns and obscene images as well as swastikas and translations of German words. It was later established that Richard thought Nazis were after him and he believed that they were placing radios in his soap. He was obsessed with the Nazis and thought his mother was in communications with them, and also that the Nazis were working in conjunction with UFOs to get him. Besides all the gore and carnage, the most disturbing thing the police found in Richard's apartment was a calendar. On the dates of the Wallen and Miroth murders, Richard had written the word today. He had also written the same word on 44 more dates in the coming year, which goes to show that Richard had done some planning concerning when he would kill again. In March of 1978, the body of the infant David Ferreira was found in a cardboard box in a vacant lot between a church and a supermarket. In police custody, Chase showed displayed no expressions of regret or guilt and willingly described his crimes in detailed manners. Because of this, along with the statements from two psychiatrists who deemed him sane at the time of the crimes, Richard Chase was found guilty on all six murder counts and sentenced to death on May 8. The trial had lasted for four months, but the jury had deliberated only for five hours before presenting the verdict. Richard Chase was sent to death row in San Quentin State Prison. One of the things he did to pass the time in prison is that he would lie in his cell and when the trailer would come by, he would hide under the covers and then pop up and laugh maniacally almost as if playing peekaboo with the jailers. Something we can assume was not taken with humor. His time in prison was not easy as his reputation preceded him and all the other inmates on death row knew that he was a baby killer. Because of this, the inmates would collect jars of urine and get it to the person closest to Richard's cell. This inmate would then splash it all over Chase while he lay in bed. Richard Trenton Chase would not take his final breath in a gas chamber as the state of California had intended. On December 26, 1980, two days before the three-year anniversary of the murder of Ambrose Griffin, Richard Chase, hanged on by fellow death row inmates, took a handful of antidepressants that he had been hoarding from his daily dose and died from an overdose. He was 30 years old. And that's it for our video on Richard Chase. We hope you found it informative and thought-provoking. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more true crime content. And as always, thank you for watching.